of a really interesting organization called Empathy Media Lab. Um, Empathy Media Lab is a multi-service enterprise. It's based in Maryland, and it does things like publish content on labor and the political economy, art and culture, and, and they also provide event space and studio space and podcast space for artists and activists who want to share their stories uh, in a global format. Um, and Mr. Papp, I'm going to let him talk more about uh, about this enterprise, but I wanted to just sort of introduce him as well, because Mr. Pat brings to this work uh, uh, over a decade of experience in consulting and developing and managing communications for a whole host of different types of um, organizations, including the US government and private industry and nonprofits. Um, and he has also launched several startups, which I find it very interesting, including a permaculture farm and an international, international labor radio and podcast network. Um, he spent five years in the Peace Corps before doing that, working in areas like emergency health and rural education and public outreach. Um, he has a master's degree in public policy and he earned his bachelor's degree in philosophy and political science. So Evan, um, you know, your breadth and depth of commitment is, um, is stunning. And I am very, very pleased and we are very fortunate to have you with us this evening. Thank you so much for this opportunity to talk to new people and, and meet new people and also see some old faces as well. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my origin story and then get into Empathy Media Lab, share some content and then provide some time for answering any questions. And of course, I wanna just put out there right now that if you have to jump off early or something like that, um, I want to be as accessible as possible because I've only gotten here through the help of a lot of other people who've uh, helped me along the way and kind of allow me to overcome um, different obstacles and uh, different things that, you know, I that seemed unsolvable. And then just one person can come in and in five minutes kind of help with that solution. So the main takeaways I want to share and it, a lot of people, you know, you're still in undergrad and you're still trying to figure out which way you want to go and there's going to be a lot of people who's going to be putting pressure on you that this is the way or that's the way and that's going to be based from their own experience but the main takeaways and I'm going to emphasize it now and at the end but the most the most valuable thing in all of our lives is our attention and where we put our attention and who we give our attention to and what we give our attention to that will determine the path of our life so try to, and our attention is constantly being competed, especially now with all the social media and everything else. There's a lot of competition for everyone's attention. And being in media myself, I'm also trying to compete for people's attention. And I'm also aware of my own lack of attention sometimes, you know, when I'm just mindlessly scrolling through social media and things like that. But attention is the most valuable thing in anyone's life and guard it and cultivate it and strengthen it and your ability for attention. Uh, another uh, takeaway is there is no set path in life. Every person has to live their own life. And there is the future is unwritten. Your life is your own life and it's gonna be your own path. There's, there are definite paths that are well-trodden more than others, but your life is your own, your own path. And ultimately you have to, to walk it. And something that's going to come through tonight is for me, I see a lot of people that are feeling a lot of despair. And especially today after last many years of just feeling beaten down by the, the system, by lack of economic opportunities, by the politics. But there's a lot of people that really are, are feeling so depressed because they don't have meaning in their life. And there's they're trying to figure out like what what is the reason detra in in life and i've always found the more you help other people the more meaning you're going to find in your life and the more you're going to learn to uh really find your path and and get over those moments of depression that that everyone is, you goes through 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 the course of a life so with that i'll go a little bit into my story or a lot into my story and um talk a bit about my, my personal 
upbringing and professional life and, and just some of the vision. But I was born in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, my parents grew up in a pretty like impoverished uh, situation. My mom grew up with seven kids in an Irish Catholic family. My dad, Hungarian uh, neighborhood in Cleveland at that time. And uh, I moved around a lot growing up and I, I lived in like eight different houses by the time I was uh, five years old. But then I ended up settling in Western Michigan. My father got a job in aluminum anodizing as in manufacturing. And I had a, a very like lovely life in, in Western Michigan, very provincial, um, lived right you know on the, the Lake Michigan beaches, uh, did lots of sports and playing around, wasn't the most literate person and things like that. But um, I, I just had a, a great you know, upbringing and, and very humbled to have that experience in Western Michigan and then ended up going to University of Michigan. And through the course of this, my parents always kind of emphasized that there are other people in the world, that the government has a purpose to solve these issues and that the government isn't always the enemy because my mother's parents, for instance, um, were saved by the New Deal policies of getting the first public housing in Cleveland. So I, I didn't have this anti-government view. I, I've always had this view that the government can work, but it's oftentimes ran by uh, people who uh, don't really care about other people, but it is based on our input and our mobilization and our solidarity working with each other that can actually change the community. And my mother, uh, she ran for school board when I was growing up as well. So I had a little bit of that political um, experience, or at least um, brought, brought into like my path from a younger age. And then from that, I was, uh, went undergrad, uh, University of Michigan, and studied political science and philosophy. And I was very much focused on going to law school. And I was in a relationship at that time. And like so many relationships, uh, when you're 22, uh, it's the entire world. And I was going to law school in Southern California to follow a girl who was going to medical school. And uh, we ended up breaking up. And it was simply because she asked the most mature question was like, do not go to law school just for me, go to law school for you. And then I, I really thought about that. And I was like, well, I actually wasn't ready to go to law school. I, I wanted to get more experience. I hadn't even traveled abroad outside of you know, Canada before then. And so I deferred law school and I did a, a long hike on the Pacific Crest Trail for, for 400 miles. And I decided that I needed another year off and I ended up waiting tables, moving to Albuquerque, stay with a friend on his couch for a year in 2002, waiting tables at night and substitute teaching during the day, saved up uh, a good amount of money and then went to Europe for the first time and backpacked across Europe. And uh, during this time we were in the run up to the Iraq war, the US invasion in Iraq. And my father, he was in Vietnam, he got drafted and he never thought we would be dumb enough to go invade another country like we did in, in uh, Iraq. Yet when I was hiking the Pacific Crest Trail and all the media I was reading, it, it was like this decision was already made. We were going into Iraq. And uh, when I ended up getting to uh, Europe, uh, we had just started the invasion in uh, March, 2003. And so that also really created a lot of discontent in, in just my feelings towards society, towards my country, uh, towards the US. Um, and I, I realized then that I, the, the heterodox lifestyle of you know, college, go to law school, get a good paying job, get married, all these other things, I, I was off that path and I, I, was, I was off the orthodox path and into like the heterodox kind of uh, view of things. So when I was in Europe too, I, I was able to kind of really meet some great people and see, you know, beautiful parts of Europe. And, it, and on the Eurorail pass, it was awesome. You know, there wasn't many, there's not very good rail system in the United States. And um, I stopped in Paris at this uh, Shakespeare and Company bookstore, which I'm going to bring up later. But anyone who's been to Paris, if you've been to uh, 
Cathedral Notre Dame. In uh, the um, Spanish Quarter, there's this Shakespeare and Company bookstore, and there's a lot of uh, writers who've passed through there, and they actually have beds in the store, and there are writers who live there, and they also publish there, but then they have to work and they get paid, but they're living like right in one of the most uh, culturally rich parts of the city right there. And uh, I, I was like, that is that is the coolest thing ever. I, I was very interested in writing at the time and, and learning more music and uh, being a writer myself. And I was like, I, I want to go, you know, work at Shakespeare and Company bookstore. But I never did. And um, I ended up coming back from Europe and I got the travel bug in me. And uh, I was at the crossroads. I was supposed to go to law school in Southern California or not. And I ended up applying to Peace Corps and, and going to um, Zambia. And that was one of the major first, uh, like major crossroads after deferring, uh, deferring law school. And so Peace Corps in Zambia, uh, when I heard Zambia, I was thinking Zimbabwe. Uh, it, I didn't even actually know where Zambia was. That's how ignorant I was in the geography. And for anyone who may be looking up where Zambia is right now, it is in Southern uh, Africa. So you got South Africa, Botswana, and then Zambia, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I lived in a very rural area, no electricity, no running water, uh, cooking over an open fire. Um, it was a three hour bike ride literally to the Peace Corps house where there was electricity and, and refrigeration and things like that. And I just got to see a lifestyle that I could have only seen by this gift given to me by the United States government. And this idea of sending Americans abroad, they kind of, it, it was packaged like you're doing international development, but what it really is, the value of it is giving Americans a new understanding of what the world is and learning about the world through this, this travel. And we did some development in um, rural distance education, uh, learned a lot about just the challenges of living in a place with very little infrastructure. I, and then also learning just about another culture and then trying to explain my culture while being extremely culturally isolated in a country that I'm listening to shortwave radio on the BBC every day about what we're doing in Iraq and, and trying to talk about that. So came back uh, in 2007. Uh, I ended up extending for a third year in uh, Peace Corps Zambia. And uh, when I came back in 2007, I was looking at uh, potentially getting a job in Washington, D.C. doing Peace Corps recruitment. And I was also wasn't sure I was going to get the job. So I was kind of like, OK, I'm still a little tired. I, I want to travel more. I'm not sure the United States is for me. And so I started looking at teaching English as a second language in Korea. And the plan was to go to South Korea, teach English for a year, save up cash. And then there was this amazing language program in Yemen. And this was before all of the tragedy of Yemen over the past decade has, has really happened. And it was this incredible program where I could learn Arabic and live in Yemen in the the old city of Sana'a. And uh, I, I was like, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to travel through Southeast Asia, end up in Yemen, and then come back um, after that, and then maybe go to grad school, and uh, I'll have my book done and all this other stuff. But despite failing the first interview of Peace Corps uh, recruitment in mid-Atlantic region, they called back like three weeks later, um, right when I was like a few days from sending my passport to South Korea, to get the actual visa to, to, to start the program. So 2007, I end up moving to uh, Washington, DC, and I'm doing outreach and recruitment with the Peace Corps. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a really good job where I'm getting paid to talk about the Peace Corps to people who want to hear about it. Because obviously, you know, when I first came back from the Peace Corps, that's all I could talk about. And, you know, most people were, would get very bored and just like their eyes would roll over. Um, so this was a very good experience. It was uh, a steady, you know, 40 hour a week job. Uh, I was living in a little box in DuPont Circle. Uh, and 
at the same time was able to travel a little bit in West Virginia, trying to do some recruitment out there in North Carolina and Virginia as well. And at that time, I was looking at grad school, uh, looking at grad schools, public universities, because I didn't want to go into debt, uh, going to American University or George Washington or Georgetown. So I was looking at George Mason and University of Maryland, and University of Maryland also had a, a Peace Corps uh, fellowship through that. So I ended up applying for that. And then another crossroads happened where um, I was presented with this opportunity to go to Jamaica to do a short-term six-month contract for uh, emergency medicine. And I had just got my EMTB. And my boss at the time at Peace Corps was like, oh, you don't want to do that. You want to stay in the Peace Corps. You, you're a civil servant now. And that what that means is like, once you're in, you're in, you can start accumulating uh, years and things like that. If you break that right now, you know, you, you're, you're losing a good thing. And for me, uh, part of me, you know, was like, okay, that makes a lot of sense. But the other part of me was like, when am I going to have this opportunity again? I've always wanted to live in Jamaica. One of the first albums I got was Bob Marley Legends in seventh grade and uh, wanted to, and I love warm water and let's, let's do this. Let's go to Jamaica. So I end up going to Jamaica for six months and uh, come back and go to grad school at University of Maryland School of Public Policy, uh, focus on international security, economic policy. And uh, for about two years, um, I'm in grad school and I'm having a lot of, um, a lot of conflict with a lot of the professors, you know, even on who are trying to teach international development from a very high level academic and not really um, wanting to engage on the fact that my experience was everywhere I went, everyone wanted electricity, everyone wanted running water, everyone uh, wanted a job, employment, uh, everyone wanted housing. And I, and I realized like, these are universal values and why can't we at least settle on this as a, a baseline? And then we can talk about agency and ethics and all these other things, but that was my experience. So after my first year at uh, School of Public Policy, I realized this wasn't helping my grades by challenging people's orthodoxies that they've spent their entire lives um, writing books on. So finished uh, the, the second year um, kind of underwhelmingly and you know, looking at coming out of grad school, I'm $35,000 in debt and I'm trying to figure out what my next move is. And like so many people in college, you're, you're doing these internships and oftentimes you're not getting paid. And you're also trying to figure out, um, you know, like where are you going to get your opportunity? Where are you going to get your break? And I ended up getting my break um, looking at USAID. I was, uh, even throwing my hat into um, working in Afghanistan because they were so desperate. And even though I didn't believe in Afghanistan, I didn't believe in the policy in Afghanistan, I realized like if I do that for a year and I don't get hurt uh, and I don't hurt anyone, I can at least pay off my debt and hopefully do some good in the process. And, uh, but I, and I also applied to a PhD program at Howard University in Africa Studies and wanted to focus on AFRICOM. And I ended up getting in to that and ended up getting on like a delayed cycle for the Afghanistan uh, job. And during one of my internships, I, I met a person who was a political appointee at USAID and uh, she worked in the Africa Bureau and we connected and I applied for the job and I was able to get a one-year contract under one of the 26 USAID mechanisms that's not a foreign service officer. And uh, did that for a year. And then from that, as that was ending, I jumped to another contract um, in this uh, office that focuses on conflict and uh, humanitarian assistance. And it was really focused on a lot of communications on this side. And during that time, while I was in grad school and my first year in, at USAID, I was really interested in everything that was going on with Occupy Wall Street. And I realized that media is kind of the tip of the spear of trying to get your ideas across, of trying to organize people and, and really trying to make changes from the activist bottom up to the top. 
And so I was taking classes at DC TV, which is just a public access with an awesome staff, awesome, very inexpensive um, lessons and education on technical uh, field uh, recording, editing, production. They have great studios. It's right at uh, in Brooklyn. And uh, took a bunch of classes and then really kind of like sold myself like, hey, I'm this videographer. And that's how I got the second job uh, at USAID where I was doing communications in this conflict humanitarian zone. And uh, during that time, that's when I was like able to pay off my, my debt. And some of my negative views of the world became a little less negative when I felt some agency, when I wasn't under the pressure of this economic, uh, under the economic pressure of, of being in debt and having to make payments and things like that. And so I was able to save up a little, little money. And during that time, I was also really interested in um, developing like a, a farm. So I worked with some folks and this was kind of, I wore the Monday through Friday, 40 hour a week uh, work at USAID. And then I was also this bureaucratic entrepreneur on the side. And uh, what I'm about to tell you, I can write the book on how not to start a business. Uh, but that being said, I ended up um, starting a, a company called Soul Shakedown. Uh, and from that, it was an LLC and it's Soul Shakedown DC. And I was doing a lot of uh, video uh, work around Occupy Wall Street and some of these activist groups and just using um, iMovie and things like that and just trying to learn through doing and just keep making things and learning and learning. And some of the work is, is a lot better than the other work. But um, I also was met with um, five other people and uh, because of like the 2008 crash and a lot of things going on, we got into this permaculture idea of like, okay, we're gonna buy some land and it's gonna be our prepper bug out community that we can also use for food, event space. And uh, it can be like a Airbnb type thing as well for revenue. And uh, we started, we, we pulled our money together and it was me, my girlfriend at the time and four other people. And uh, we bought this 15 acre uh, place um, just south of Berkeley Springs and we called it Liberty Root. And uh, it's just beautiful, beautiful place uh, out in West Virginia and working during the week and then you know two weekends a month doing the two hour drive each way and uh, just really enjoying it. But you know, doing a lot of, lot of grinding, a lot of you know, 60, 80, 80 hour work, uh, weeks to, to try to make this happen, this vision happen. And then on the side, on top of that, trying to also do some activism. And uh, after a while, uh, the Liberty Root uh, dream kind of started fading because it was just six people. We didn't have a great business plan. We didn't have everything um, really locked down going into it. And uh, you know, life happens and people start pulling away and things like that. So that was a, a lesson learned. And um, then from that as well, uh, I started, you know, keep thinking about like, okay, well, what about this media thing that I'm really interested in? And so I created Empathy Media Lab as I was working at USAID to really focus on um, what, like this idea of like a publishing company, an event space, and also an artist studio. So in that meantime, I, I jumped from another uh, office at USAID to Power Africa, and I was doing communications for a pretty high level um, Obama initiative, a presidential initiative that was looking at increasing generation of power in Africa and also increasing connections, so uh, electrical connections. And um, that, that was like a really, that was like, okay, this is actually something that I'm really interested in is like infrastructure, energy, um, this, so I, I learned a lot through Power Africa uh, while slowly kind of putting together this Empathy Media Lab. And, um, you know, the, the administration happened and I was starting to get pretty disgusted with everything of doing international development work while, while I felt, you know, our, my country in the United States was falling apart. Um, and so I wanted to focus more on domestic activism. I wanted to focus more on 
labor issues and it was a 2020 election. So another kind of crossroads in my life. And I ended up uh, leaving USAID and I was able to save up some cash. And I was like, this is the time in my life. I'm uh, 41 years old and I'm going to take a sabbatical and I'm going to see where it leads. And, and I'm able to kind of make this move. So I started doing Empathy Media Lab full time to focus on labor, political economy, art and culture. And some people have asked like, why empathy? And it, it's almost like when, when I came up with this, you know, the concept of Empathy Media Lab, 2017, uh, 2000, yeah, about 2016, 2017, empathy wasn't quite as ubiquitous as it, it is now. And it's getting to a point where I, I'm sometimes even like, okay, empathy is now being used for marketing to make money, which has nothing to do with empathy. And, uh, but this is the brand that I'm going to stick with because the concept of empathy is to try to get everyone to understand where everyone else is coming from. It's not about agree, agreement and things like that. And there is this tension between the harmony of interest where your gain is my gain and the zero sum game where your gain is my loss and my gain is your loss. And I really wanna come with this harmony of interest and most people in the world want the same things they want. And there, there is this harmony that we, that your gain can be my gain. Our gain together can, can be everyone's gain. There is though a faction and, and we can find it both internally and externally and in the, the micro and macrocosm of, of the universe, but there is the zero sum game. And we often find that uh, these factions and uh, organizations and these, um, this certain pathology of thinking is what is, uh, is winning and taking over much of the political economic system. Another thing about empathy is that uh, James Baldwin talks about this a lot where when you're going through suffering, you feel like your suffering is the greatest suffering that has ever happened in the world and that your suffering is unique. And the fact is, when you look around, everyone has gone through suffering, will go through suffering, and may be going through suffering right now. And the suffering, if you can empathize with each other on the suffering concept, you can actually build bridges with each other. But it, it requires a step of, of understanding what your own thoughts are and you have to make that choice. You have to make that effort to, to want to understand where someone's coming from to help build that bridge. So why labor, political economy, art, and culture? Well, it's you know obviously a huge umbrella. Um, labor, I've learned, uh, is, and I'm, I've been an unorganized worker. I've not been in labor unions. Uh, myself, my grandfather on my mom's side, he was in the steel mills in, in Cleveland, and he always spoke highly of the labor unions. Um, and my mom spoke highly of the labor unions uh, growing up and the teachers unions and things like that. But myself, even at USAID, there's a very strong foreign service officer union, but I was one of the temporary uh, contracts. So in, in some ways, um, I wasn't undermining the union, but I, I definitely was an unorganized worker. But the unions, the union solidarity concept is it's both a means and an end in the sense that it's democracy in the workplace. It's it, now the unions, can, let's, let's get it over with and just say it, unions can be a pain in the ass. They can be a difficult place to come to consensus and, and things like that. But the, the union is the democracy in the workplace. And it's the only way to have a power block that can actually counter what management may be saying. And on top of that, the people on the floor who are actually doing a lot of the production, a lot of the services on the floor, they're gonna be the most equipped to make the business work better. They're gonna see ways to improve the business. They're gonna see ways to make it safer. And so by allowing, by, by increasing the support for labor on that side too, you're, you're going to improve the business operations. And they, I think should, I think labor should obviously share a huge part of the fruits of the labor um, as you're going through it. So labor I, I think is, is key to going forward in, in our system and throughout the world and, and organizing not only 
uh, locally and nationally, but internationally as well, and and holding and and having solidarity with workers in China, Vietnam, and anywhere else in the world where there may be exploitation going on, and holding our own transnational corporations to the same standards that we want to be held here. That for anything that they do abroad, political economy is it, oftentimes we hear just economics, economics. But when you go back uh, not too long ago, the, they would never have separated economics from politics. So economics and, and politics is always going to be connected. Political eco economics can never be separated from politics. Political economy, when you think about every um, currency that's issued, it's coming from a government. Taxes, the markets are enforced by laws that are dependent on a government. So it's always political economy. And you have a lot of people in economics who have no historical, have no history background in economics and the and no understanding of what the classical understanding of economics is. So bringing in political economy and looking at industrial policy, looking at infrastructure, looking at things like water, food, energy, transportation, communication, education, healthcare, a welfare state, those type of things are all um, very important. And then art and culture, um, in some ways, that's going to shape your, your labor and your political economy. The culture will is, is responding to it, but if you can bring higher levels of love, beauty, justice, and things like that into your art, into your culture, and culture can be everything from religion to language to food, um, and art can be anything from music to writing to visual arts to performance arts and things like that. That is going to have an impact on your, your political economy and in how you organize people in your, your labor circles. So the revenue model uh, right now is for Empathy Media Lab is looking at, right now I, I do consultancies on the side. Um, I worked closely with Labor Radio Podcast Network uh, as it has gotten off the ground. And just a, a little plug on that. It was started by this guy, Chris Garlock, uh, who is the lead communicator of AFL-CIO Washington, DC Metro Council. And he's on uh, Your Rights at Work on WPFW 89.3. And uh, he's got like three different uh, podcasts. And then he's also kind of running this on the side. And during uh, 2020, when I was like, you know, in my gap year doing my sabbatical, I was so interested in labor. I was, I was, um, somebody put me in touch with him. And so then I just started volunteering and started helping with editing a lot of podcasts, helping with the website and things like that. And uh, he was also interested in some of the work that I was doing in my gap year in 2020, because I, I did a labor documentary series where I went to Pittsburgh, uh, Detroit, uh, Michigan, Benton Harbor, Michigan, Cleveland, and in Chicago, and did a bunch of labor kind of history activist uh, films. And he used some of the audio for some of uh, his podcasts. And that's, that's how we got connected. So it's almost like, when you put yourself out there, you know, you will, things will start happening, but that it, there is that first step of really trying to put yourself out there. I've also been lucky enough. Um, in 2014, I was through you know, the funding of USAID and through the work at USAID, I was able to buy a house. Uh, it's in Hyattsville. Um, and I, the buying the house, I bought the title to the house. I'm, you know, the, the bank owns it for another 28 years, uh, or I, I guess I refinance, but uh, 27 years. Uh, but in, in this house, I've been um, focused on creating a podcast studio. I converted my living room into a music practice space that we're going to be doing a lot more live streaming for music over the winter, and then in the backyard doing an event space. And we've held some weddings there and it have held some um, different types of art, art uh, variety shows with comedy and music and uh, activism as well. So those are kind of the, the two lanes. And then the, the third lane is, is publishing. So I've been interviewing um, many different people, um, everything from authors and, and learning the, the art of podcasting. And I, over the course of the year, I was able to do about 170 uh, podcasts and met a lot of good people. I, I use it, um, the podcast, obviously, to, to get out these ideas. But 
I'm also been finding my own voice because I've been so much behind the camera. And, and I think a big part of what everyone sh really should be trying to do is you need to find your own voice. Everyone has their own voice. And for me, um, asking questions, hearing my, my voice, you know, that I'm uncomfortable listening to, um, trying to speak more eloquently, being a better listener when I'm asking the questions, not just reading from the script, but, but really trying to engage. This is going to be a lifelong project, and there's there's no ceiling where it's like, okay, I've I've mastered this. I I think you can always get better, and you can see a lot of podcasters and and people who do interviews for their their life life uh, work. Uh, they make it look like seamless and and easy, but it it comes through you know thousands of hours of of effort to to get to that that level. Um, and the publishing too, I, as I'm going into the new year, I'm looking at, as I mentioned, the live stream uh, studio. I'm working on the philosophy of political economy project. So it's kind of looking at developing a pedagogy on political economy and philosophy that I did not receive even at the School of Public Policy, which is right down the road at University of Maryland, where no one spoke about the New Deal. No one spoke about how we went from a depression with no banks working in 1933 to being able to rebuild um, 70,000 bridges and uh, 10,000 schools and hospitals and how, how this happened. And most people have completely lost understanding that even when you're completely bankrupt, there is still this way that the government can reorganize finance to not only rebuild the, the entire country, but also provide union wage jobs for everyone and 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 that i believe that um employment is is uh, a right and and that the government should be uh, ensuring full employment especially in these hard times um and looking a little bit more i'm gonna be doing a lot more work with the uh, labor radio podcast network uh and going into the future doing more live streaming and, and doing some more short films and documentaries and things like that so I'm just going to do one more short one. And this one uh, was around the 100 year anniversary of the Battle of Blair Mountain, uh, which it took place in West Virginia. Most people do not know about it. Remembering the Battle of Blair Mountain. 100 years ago in 1921, a multiracial uprising of Union coal miners commandeered trains and cars across the state of West Virginia and emptied armories of their contents as they marched to the town of Mingo, where a hundred of their fellow Union miners were being held without charge by the corrupt authorities. Somewhere around 15,000 miners engaged in three days and nights of crossfire with thousands of the more well-to-do members of West Virginia society, including every cop in the entire state and all the gun thugs and the mine operators could find available to hire. The bosses used the racial divide in the U.S. to keep the working class in a constant state of conflict. So much of the labor movement of the day rejected this strategy and employed their own strategy of inclusion. Of the 15,000 or so people laying siege to Mingo at the end of August of that year, an estimated 2,000 of them were black. This was a multiracial uprising of unprecedented scale. During the three days that the miners were trying to liberate their comrades imprisoned in Mingo, dozens of people were killed, the total numbers never to be known. Thousands of women of all backgrounds were actively involved with the struggle, coordinating essential logistics like food and medical care for the thousands of men under arms. Planes were flown in from bases hundreds of miles away to drop bombs on the Union miners. There is so much more that can be said about what led to both the Tulsa pogrom and the multiracial uprising in West Virginia, which both happened within months of each other in 1921. The impact of the unspeakably horrendous bloodbath known as World War I, along with the terribly devastating global pandemic that it gave rise to, would be hard to overstate. In the face of such a long-standing history of white supremacy and settler colonialism, so much of the labor movement explicitly rejected that nonsense. It's so important that all of these things be remembered. There is another America. Remember it. Those miners died for you. You should at least know who they were. And then let's all follow in their footsteps. Long live the multiracial uprising in the hills of Appalachia 
in 1921. Long live the Battle of Blair Mountain. To the company store. What a journey. I do want to ask you because unbelievable. I mean, your your life is what did you you called it? Um, the the orthodox and the unorthodox you know, orthodox possible orthodox. paths that we've gotten. You've had the most unorthodox. Uh, uh, you're an, a perfect example of lifelong learning, right? And learning through life. Um, it's, it's really, really incredible. And I appreciate your tension. It sounds like one of the themes of this is, you know, should I do it this way or should I do it the old fashioned way, right? Should I, should I go to graduate school or should I take a year off and do something else? Should I, it's just um, really inspirational. Um, it makes me want to ask you about uh, uh, your work with Empathy Media Lab now. Do you see this as your destination or do you have your sights on something after this? I mean, you, it sounds like it's an incredible, like, you know, experiment. And yeah. I'm just curious to know what you're thinking about next. Yeah, so I didn't tie it in, but the idea of like the the art hostel uh, idea where I, while I was in Europe, I was staying in a lot of hostels and I was like, oh, this is really interesting. and. The idea of being able to create a space where artists can come and create art and you can do work and things like that. Um, right now, I'm, I'm trying to put in all my effort to make this project work. And, you know, like with anything in life, you got to take some risk and you got to be willing to fail. But uh, right now, I'm, I'm all in on this and I'm going to find myself interested in politics and trying to make the, the world a better place and while also doing my own creative work um and and collaborating with good people you know for the rest of my life so if it's not empathy media lab then it may be something else but for right now uh i do have a couple uh several contracts some other things may be coming in so mm -hmm. things are starting to move mm -hmm. well it also sounds like you're, you're you're doing is weaving things together right i mean you're pulling so many so many different strands into this one 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 multi multi-part effort that um yeah, I can see where you know you can you can do a lot within yeah. the structure that you've gotten developed here. Yeah, that's great. I have a question about Media Lab also, and um, and and then there are a couple of questions in the the chat that I that I hope we can get to also. Um, who do you see as your audience for the work that you're doing with Empathy Media Lab? Yeah, that's a great question, and it it is very varied. So in some ways the labor communities and but everyone works like not everyone but most people are working class and so that's a pretty broad audience and then the people who are going to be interested in political economy and policy that's going to be more focused towards the policy makers politicians bureaucrats those type of things mm -hmm. um professors and 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 students who are interested and then the art and culture i think you know trying to seed some of these ideas you know on the TikTok uh, into the metaverse and uh wherever else it's it's going to to try to bring in something a little higher consciousness than just consumption and things like that mm, that's an interesting um I, I i was thinking that this would be my last comment but i'll say it while i'm while I'm thinking about it because that have you ever thought about becoming a teacher i mean my goodness what a wealth of experience and knowledge you bring to the table no and, I, and i've taught um you know every bunch of different ages and i i need to write my book uh that i'm i'm hoping that this political economy pedagogy even i have one minute videos and if i do you know a couple hundred of them that'll be enough to put a book together and uh use that as kind of a school and i i love teaching and i, I learned so much uh teaching and uh you got to prepare a lot for teaching and and every generation every student can bring um new new perspectives that you can really learn from yeah yeah and i mean the format of education is changing all the time so yeah i think you're going to be well well prepared for whatever's coming down the road there that's terrific there is a really interesting question i, I think you can probably see the chat too so you can see this as well someone is asking about um how uh white privilege might have affected the work that you do oh yeah well, you know, as you can see, I'm of the pink tone, the, the whiter tone here. Uh, so I've been, you know, very, I've, I've been given a lot, right? I've been my, I've, I've economically, you know, socially, culturally, I've, I've taken more than I've given. 
And in that view and, and coming to that realization that I've taken more than I've given, if I die today, then I will have regrets because I've taken more than I've given. And so my goal is to continue to try to build things that I've been given and make sure everyone is given that. And that's not just in the United States. That's where it's like everyone should have electricity. Everyone should have, you know, everything. And so like the white privilege, obviously being white in the United States, especially for the last 40 years of my upbringing, um, that, that is the most privileged, uh, you know, race and things like that. Um, at the same time, the, what the video showed too is that a lot of the racial divisions are being stoked to keep us from working together too. So, so I think to try to understand each other and through that empathy, um, I've, I've learned a lot uh, through, through being humble of my own, you know, hubrises and, and realizing my own errors and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think like the working class solidarity needs to transcend the, the acknowledging the race, acknowledging the divisions, acknowledging the, the differences in immigration and everything else. But it's only through the union solidarity that we are going to be able to, to move forward and not just be picked apart and divided again and again. Yeah. Well, that's, a, that's like a, a whole discussion, isn't it? Um, yeah, that, that's, that's really thought provoking. Um, okay, so, uh, so, th so there are two other questions here. And one of them is um, from Anne Marcel. She's asking uh, of you about the hardest question that you've had to grapple with doing this work? I mean, these are not easy questions, are they? You guys have got great questions here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, um, and, I, and I appreciate um, I appreciate them so much. Um, so there's been times where I'm interviewing people. Okay, so I, I did this interview for USAID and it was in Haiti and it was looking at the work that USAID had done after the earthquake. And we went up to the north of Haiti to celebrate this new textile, this Korean textile firm. And my job was to interview this Haitian woman who worked there and to try to get a success story out of it, right? And I know a lot of history, not uh, people know more than me, but I know a good deal of history. I know a lot of the issues with Haiti and this Korean firm um, was kicked out of Guatemala for labor practices and set shop up in Northern Haiti. And uh, this was like the big celebration of USAID and the Clinton initiative and uh, Hillary Clinton at that time was secretary of state. And um, I'm in this room interviewing this woman at the plant where there is the, this textiles. And it, it was almost like kind of like a sweatshop that I'm going in, I'm filming I'm like, this is crazy. This is insane that I'm in here. And I have these like activist you know, thoughts and just being like, this is crazy. It's success story on this. And uh, I'm in this room and the boss is around and her manager's around and I don't speak Creole. I don't speak French. And I'm trying to ask these questions. And, um, and I realized in that situation, there, there is no truth that, that I'm going to get from her. Uh, you know, unfortunately, it, it is just, um, I got I to gotta take the fact that I was there and I, I was able to bear witness of the fact that we've so-called, you know, the West has put in hundreds of billions of dollars in Haiti. And yet this 100 kilometer road from St. Mark, which is just outside of Port-au-Prince up to Cap Haitian, is, is like a bombed out road that take, took four hours to drive up to. And I'm, I'm sitting at the bar talking to this inter-American inter bank guy uh, from, I, I think, Ecuador. And he's like, yeah, it costs about 10 million per kilometer. So for, you know, the, the, for a billion dollars, this road could be built. And yet we're celebrating all these things. There's no road. And so I need to, so that's part of me taking, right? So yeah. what I owe now, is to, to not only try to tell this person's story, but, but to use what I've been given and, and try to do some good with it. I think that that is a, um, it may be a great place to stop to keep us thinking because I think when you talk about empathy, just to kind of full circle around, having empathy for people that we don't necessarily agree with 
or who are doing things that we don't necessarily agree with is, is maybe one of the hardest things to, uh, to put that into practice. And I think for all of us, if we can have that as a, um, as a kind of a mantra, like here I am in this difficult place, let me see how I can apply empathy to what I'm, what I'm facing right now. I think that, that um, that's an excellent uh, lesson for us. Yeah, thank Evan, you. thank you so much for, for coming in this evening. This has been really, really inspiring, really incredible. And I hope that we can keep this conversation going. Thank you. And, and just with the, the final minute too, I, I really wanna thank everyone for you know, uh, engaging and I'm open on LinkedIn. I'm open if you wanna just try to be like, oh, get connected with that person. I can try to make the introduction. Uh, if you have story ideas, things like that, you wanna collaborate on. Um, let's let's definitely talk even if you're looking for a place to publish something and you don't know where to go and just the key takeaways you know it, our attention is our most valuable uh, possession in life and uh, there is no set path and uh, service to others is where we're going to find the most meaning so thanks again